<clears throat> Welcome everyone to uh, this week's City Futures seminar. My name is uh, Lee Roberts, and um, I am going to sort of bookend today. I'm, I'm one of the presenters for today, but I'll start with a first acknowledgement that uh, at least for those of us in the room on the Kensington campus, uh, we're here on uh, unceded digital land. Uh, and so I'd like to pay my respects to uh, elders past and present and to any First Nations people joining us today. Um, I'd also like to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so for those of us, for those of you joining online, if you could uh, please mute your microphone and turn off your camera during the presentations. Um, that would be great. And then at the end, when we do Q and A, uh, feel free to turn on your mics and your cameras again uh, if you want to ask a question. But you can also uh, put a question into the chat. Um, Richard is here in the room, uh, monitoring the chat, so you can make sure that your question gets asked uh, if you want to write it down as we go along. Um, so with that, I'll uh, introduce. A little bit of uh, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Brian Lee, and he's a senior lecturer, soon to be an associate professor uh, in city planning, but he's also uh, one of the co-leads of our new sustainable mobilities group within City Futures. Um, and uh, so he'll be, and I will be presenting today um, on our, our active transport research that we've been doing over the last couple of years. So with that, I'll turn it over to Brian to get started. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Lee. Um, so should I use this? Uh, yes, as yeah. soon as it's ready. Um, thanks for joining us today, Friday afternoon, and also by online. Uh, I'm Brian, again, uh, senior lecturer in transport. My background is transport planning, and uh, as a team with Dr. Lee Roberts and Dr. Hawa, you could make it today. We do research in cycling. Uh, I think our research aim or my personal research interest is providing evidence or developing tools to assist decision making for infrastructure planning and also for formulation of strategies to promote sustainable travel behavior. Uh, today, I'd like to share some research findings from our recent research project in cycling, which we conducted together with Dr. Lee Roberts. Um, we were involved in a number of research projects. Should I talk more loudly, by the way? Or is oh, you're good. <laughs> in the last few years, uh, including the most recent one, which is the uh, five-year longitudinal study with the city of Sydney to understand people's perception change before and after a provision of new cycleway. And also, our colleague, uh, Dr. Mike Harris, is leading I move by bicycle simulator study to understand infrastructure preference of interest in the consent group. But today I'd like to focus on these three research projects we have either completed or completing, including the uh, um, Greater Sydney Cycling Attitude and Behavior Surveys, and our study to understand the needs of the adults the adolescent group in Greater City uh, to make them to adapt cycling. And lastly, if we have fun, I'd like to shortly uh, introduce our cycling infrastructure scenario built up as the last component. So we actually conducted two surveys in last year. One survey was the uh, for the adults group, adults group. And the other one was for the high school students. They were actually part of two different projects. But our intention, why we did this survey, is because, as you know, the cycling participation in Australia, especially in Sydney, is extremely low. It's less than 2%, the proportion of population riding bicycle for more than transport. So we like to understand what people need to adapt cycling. But because the cycling population is so small, there's no guarantee that this less than 2% of the population can represent the rest 98% of the population. So our research aim through that we have established to achieve through this survey was to understand 
these two four types of cyclists or non cyclists new cyclists, existing cyclists, and former cyclists who stopped cycling in the last 12 months. And finally, non cyclists, what they want, what's the motivation, what's the barrier to the cycling. Also, we want to know their perceived safety level with different types of cycling lanes to understand which type of cycling lanes we need to build more to encourage cycling, especially for this group and for this group. And lastly, we also wanted to understand the impact of cycling infrastructure, what's the ideal infrastructure quality, quantity, and the characteristics to promote more cycling and the building of the and who is more likely to start cycling when a new infrastructure is provided based on their individual factors, such as the demographic and their cycling sentiments. Again, so we conducted two surveys, and I will introduce the high school student survey and the data analysis and some findings that we have found recently in my presentation. And the next presenter, my colleague, uh, Lee Roberts, will introduce the main adult survey. Um, our primary interest was to understand how many adolescent ride bicycle, and we found that, uh, by the way, we have collected 323 balance samples among probably more than 500 samples after cleansing of the data, and we only collect the data from the high school students attending public school because the travel behavior and travel distance of private school students and South and school students can be very different. So we all invited public school students and we've got 323 samples. And according to our survey, um, about 34% uh, of the adolescent ride bicycle in a typical way. This number is very similar with the national survey conducted in this year. Our number is a little bit higher, 34 compared to about 29. And this number could be actually much higher than this because we collected data from 12 to 18, and they collect data from, I think, 10 to 17 years old. And the trend is younger adolescents are more likely to ride bicycle. So actually, our survey is actually a little bit higher than the national survey. I don't know why, because they use a telephone survey method and we use the online survey, but we have collected more sample data, by the way, in the national survey data. And what we have found, the most important thing, one of the most important findings is that, as you can see here, recreational and exercise purpose cycling is a way more popular than school community. So in the last one year, about 50% of adolescents for the bicycle. And this actually drops a little bit to 32% when we reduce the time period into the last 30 days. And then 26% and 18% only in the last one week, right? This means that recreational cycling is more popular among the adolescents, but they do not ride by school very often. It's kind of occasional riding. But compared to this, the school commuting cycling, as you can see, the trend is quite consistent. So in the last one week, 13.5%, it increased to about 15%, 15%, and 16%, right? So this means that the, the adolescent riding bicycle for school committing protocols, they ride by school regularly and consistently. Okay, that was the, one of the main, major findings from this survey. Um, the next one we were interested to investigate through the survey was the perceived safety. So how do we measure this? We actually, through the online survey, we showed the adolescent these eight different images of six different cycling lanes, by the way, including two separate bike lanes, two protected bike lanes, one painted lanes, and one local street with marking and one local street without marking. And the last one is the arterial. So we show them and let, let them pick between 
one to five, and five is the most comfortable, uh, very comfortable. Four is somewhat comfortable, neutral, somewhat uncomfortable, and very uncomfortable. And the trend is clear because more than 90% of endorsement, including cyclists and non cyclists, they said they feel comfortable riding separated. When it comes to protected, it drops a little bit to about 80 percent, uh, 80 percent. And and what this chart is clearly showing us is that a dorsal group, they prefer only these two types of cycling lanes because this proportion actually drops to 35 percent when it comes to the painted lane, local street with a shadow, local street and the Ontario. So in order to increase cycling among the other such group, we need these two, more of these two types of cycling lanes. And another investigation that we conducted is comparing the perceived safety between school commuting cyclists and recreational cyclists. The hypothesis was, uh, from here is that, from the literature, by the way, a lot of studies report that School commuting cyclists, they're more experienced than recreational. So we want to test that. And this result clearly shows, shows us the school commuting cyclists have a higher level of risk of acceptance. Because for the same type of cycling lane, they said they feel more comfortable than the recreational cyclist. And this difference is actually the largest on the painted lane and the local street. So uh, we decided to look at this difference between school commuting cyclists and recreational cyclists using uh, a psychological theory. A psychological theory called theory of plan B behavior. By the way, this was my PhD student work. It's now in Adelaide, so I couldn't make it today. This theory basically used a data is four components, attitude, subject, subjective norm, and perceived behavior control, cycling intention, to explain or predict people's behavior change. So behavior change here is adapting cycling. Okay, so through this survey, we asked people, the adolescent, their attitude and their subjective norm and their PBC. PBC means um, their skill set in cycling and their confidence with cycling and also their knowledge about cycling, such as the route, safe route in, uh, nearby their own. Um, so the theory is the attitude, subjective norm, and PVC together, they contribute to building the intention to cycle. And as the people gain more, you know, have more intention to cycle, with PVC, as they gain more skill and knowledge and confidence, they can actually start riding a bicycle. So, so we adapted this model to both recreational and um, school committee cycling. And we use a, a structural equation model as shown in this diagram here. I'm not going to explain this, but Three main findings from this modeling study. First of all, a and cycling intention is built when they have positive attitude, when they are aware well the positive outcome of the cycling, such as the health outcome, travel time saving outcome, and also they are aware when they are aware of the safety of the cycling. So when they have positive attitude and when they have access to bicycle. It actually builds the cycling intention. And when a dorsum have high level of cycling intention, and also when they have friends or family members cycling, it actually leads to them to start recreational cycling. That was the main finding. But school committing cycling was a little bit different. Not everyone rides to school, but only the children on the high adolescent who have the high level of cycling skill, confidence, and knowledge. So developing this skill, confidence, and knowledge is a critical factor 
actually to encourage existing recreational cycling cyclists to transition to commuting cycling. Uh, so I just, by the way, introduced two different studies uh, through five different slides. Main finding number one is one of every three high school students in Sydney, they ride bicycle in a typical week. And recreational cycling is a way more popular than school commuting uh, by between 1.5 to 3 times. And in order to promote recreational cycling, providing affordable bike share programs and financial subsidies to improve the access of the adolescent to bicycle will be useful. And also providing a group riding program such as bike trains and also providing safe bikeways to improve the attitude will be useful to promote recreational cycling. And the major finding is that community cyclists are relatively small. Their number is small, but they are more experienced and they're more frequent riders. And they, they have a higher level of risk acceptance. And it seems that recreational cyclists transition to school commuting as they gain experience and skill and more knowledge. So skill training programs, especially with their family members and also friends, will be quite helpful or useful to encourage this, this transition from recreational to school commuting. <clears throat> um, so as a next step, one of the findings from our survey was that the adolescent group prefer separated and, and protected cycleways. So we decide to you know, then assess how many adolescents in Greater Sydney actually have access to their catchment high school through these types of cycleways. So this map shows the um, mesh blocks in blue having cycleway connectivity to their to their um, catchment high school for every single mesh block. Uh, only by type one or type two, which means protected or separated cycleway. And we have found that only about 7.5% of the residential mesh block in Greater Sydney have a safe cycleway connection to their catchment high school. In terms of the population size, it's only 8.8%. So in Greater Sydney, only about 9% of high school aged population had safe cycleways to their catchment high school. We also, also apply the similar approach to the nearby parks rather than the school this time. And we found that away, well, about 25% of residential mesh block or 28% of the high school age population have safe cycleways to the nearby parks. Why this number is higher than the other one is because simply we have a way more number of parks than the number of high schools. But this can partially explain why you know, recreational cycling or exercise purpose cycling is still more popular than school cycling in Greater Sydney. Um, this is my last slide. So we basically measure the percent of adolescent population having access to park, nearby park, by safe cycleway, and also the same thing, population of adolescents having cycleway connection to their high school. And we plot all 33 LGAs on this chart. And we use these two average lines to divide all LJs into four groups. So the LJs in area A, meaning that um, they have relatively good cycle connection to both schools and to nearby parks. And B, they have um, relatively good connectivity to school 
but not the parks. And C, they have good connection, connectivity, cycle, and connectivity through parks, but not the school. And D, they have meter. Okay, and we found that um, Hampton, the Hills, Sydney, and Liverpool, they have the best cycling connectivity to school and also to the park. And only three allergies belongs to area B, and they are Penrith, Blue Mountain, and Sutherland. So they have a relatively good connectivity to schools, but not a park. And and so on. So basically, the main findings from this passion analysis is that non zero percent of the high school aged population living in 10 LGAs out of 33 have safe cycleways to their school. And access to parks is much easier, much safer and access to schools by cycling. And that may explain why, again, the recreational cycling is the dominant form of cycling in Sydney. And but this doesn't mean that those 10 boundaries do not have cycleways at all. They have it. Uh, most of them are disconnected. They're fragmented each other, and they lack uh, the consideration of connectivity to schools. That's it. And lastly, we found that this whole LJ, they have better connectivity. Um, should I take a question now or should I continue? Sure, go ahead. That's good. I think this is my last slide, so <laughs> I can take a question or Lee, would you like to continue? Yes. So, um, do you also know whether there are more student cyclists in the cycle lane connected high schools? Yeah, so um, I didn't mention about that, but the, because the sample size was very small, 323 only. So we really couldn't, you know, collect the data to follow the, the population distribution of the, like the LGA level, or we couldn't really ask their location where they live because they are minority group. And in terms of the ethics, that's much stricter. So unfortunately, we couldn't get that, the location data from the door set. I, I, I just wondering whether you might be considered the school catchment area. Most people actually, you know, rather than AGA is quite broad, but the school have their own catchment. Yeah. So they likely, you know, cycle within there. So, um, so we didn't use that uh, the catchment boundary for this analysis, but as an extension of this study, we actually developed a an AI based mm -hmm. route optimization tool um, to be able to provide a suggestion where to locate where to put a new cycling lanes to provide more connectivity within the catchment to their catchment school. So we have a, such a tool, but um, I'm really introducing that tool today because of the time constraint. Yep. A great study, Brian. Just wondering, in that study, contextually, have you looked at, um, found any numbers about how many kids say 10, 20 years ago were cycling to school. We talk a lot around um, with other cyclists and, you know, it's a lot of sort of feedback around how people used to cycle a lot more to school. Have you found any numbers that sort of verified the sort of the uh, shift? I've never seen such study, you know, of the past study, especially focusing on the Dorset group of old children. Uh, in Sydney, but there might be some studies, but as far as I know, I don't really know. I think the compared to adults group, there's a lack of studies looking at this endorsement group in overall, not only in Australia, but also other countries too. We had a quick question online as well, if you could. Sure. Um, could the analysis be pre-integrated to be a last 
my own gaps to the network, e.g. what are the 20 best links to prosecute to shift 90%, 40%? Yeah, that, that's uh, part of the, the our extended research we're looking at now. So um, we're looking at the boundary of the school catchment and where, where are the existing cycling lanes are and distribution of the population of the dorsant group. And based on that, the ideal location and the route of the new cycleway to provide more connectivity to the schools. Did I answer the question? Okay. Someone also wants to know if the slides will be available. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, um, so just to answer that question, so we always post, this is good for everybody to know, because I don't think we've mentioned this very often, but we do post the recordings of these uh, seminars to the City Futures webpage. Uh, it's actually, and it's also fed through the UNSW YouTube page. So uh, if you've got a question, if you can't find a particular uh, recording, uh, please, you can send us an email. There's a, my email address is on the seminar webpage. But if uh, if you do want slides as opposed to a recording, we can we can probably we can uh, well certainly for this presentation we can send you those as well. Um, great. Um, so I'm going to talk. So Brian mentioned that uh, that I'm going to present on the on the larger uh, uh, survey. I'm actually not going to talk about kind of a, the core purpose of that survey so much. I'm going to talk about kind of a side project. I think uh, if we have time today, we have a, a third section of the presentation where Brian will talk a little bit about that, uh, what we were really doing with that with that survey. So I'm going to talk about a, a bit of a side project. So uh, just to recap, um, so it was a large survey of over 2,000 uh, adults in Greater Sydney. This this survey, um, we used Qualtrics both for the online survey itself, but also. We used their online panels uh, for recruitment for the, for the study. And the, the main reason we did that rather than doing it ourselves is that uh, it, was, it was really important uh, that we have a, a representative sample of uh, the, uh, the population of Greater Sydney, not only of Greater Sydney as a whole, but at, at every LGA level, we wanted a representative sample both by gender and by age. Um, and so, so it was a lot easier for us to do that using a panel survey company. Um, Qualtrics is great for that, by the way. I'm going to plug for them. Um, so uh, this was conducted as part of a larger ARC project that we'll, uh, Brian will talk about hopefully at the end today. Uh, but I do also want to recognize that uh, the Digital Grid Futures Institute uh, also provided some funding for this, uh, largely in relation to the project that I'm going to talk about now. Uh, but the primary purpose of this survey was to develop a population model that we can use to uh, estimate the impact of new bike infrastructure. Um, kind of getting at that last question from Brian, but also something that we'll present hopefully today, but if not at our next seminar uh, on that on that dashboard itself. So um, one of the one of the interesting questions for us in looking at the survey data was to look at uh, e-bike use. I think we're all kind of aware of e-bikes being a higher and higher kind of uh, well more and more common, and also in the news, uh, both for good reasons and for bad uh, lately. Um, so we were curious um, to look at the data that we had and look at how e-bike users uh, differ from. From, from other cyclists, from cyclists using conventional bicycles. Um, and specifically, we wanted to look at, well, first of all, who's, who's riding e-bikes? Um, and do e-bikes change the way we ride bikes? Does it change how often we ride bikes, how far we go on bikes? Does it change where we ride to? Does it change the, the types of trips we can take? Um, and what are the implications for that in terms of infrastructure? And um, both in terms of the bicycle lanes themselves, but also charging infrastructure was also sort of a side question for us. As you probably have noticed in the news, we've got some we've had battery fires from uh, e-bike batteries uh, lately. Um, I'm not going to talk about that today, but it was something that we wanted to explore in this in this data. And this is just an image of 
kind of the, the broad range of bicycle of e-bikes that exist out in the world today. Uh, and really kind of if you're familiar with e-bikes at all, they're they're sort of there's an e-bike for just about every cycling niche you could imagine, um, from folding bikes to cargo bikes and everything in between. <clears throat> so why analyze e-bikes? Uh, other than what I've just talked about. What we noticed right off the bat in our survey results was that the number of e-bike users was was surprisingly high. 12% uh, of our survey respondents, respondents who told us that they own a bike or have access to a bike in their household said that they that those bikes were e-bikes. Um, and almost 8% of, of all of our survey respondents said that they had ridden an e-bike in the last year, now, which, which is considering that it's a fairly new type of bicycle, uh, at least in, as a mainstream bike, that's a pretty um, significant proportion of, of bikes. Um, and sales, uh, 75,000 e-bikes sold in the last fiscal year, and that represents 800% growth over the last five years. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a large and growing proportion of, of bikes. In, well, that, those stats are from Australia, but in New South Wales as well. So, um, so, why, so who, who are the people who ride e-bikes? So this is a really uh, important question because, you know, especially if we look at cycling in a place like Australia, which has, as Brian mentioned, a low overall cycling rate, even within that small uh, portion of the population that's cycling, it's it's that that's skewed pretty heavily towards towards men and towards younger men, right? And uh, and that's a problem for a lot of reasons, but if, if one of our goals is to increase the number of cyclists, then, uh, then if, if we're only appealing to young men, then first of all, we're, we're leaving out a, a significant portion of the population. But also, I think um, it, it, it shows that some, something in our city design or our infrastructure design or our culture or um, or our bicycle design, in, in some way, we're failing to really address our entire potential population of cyclists. Uh, and I think it's, a, it's important to recognize that, that, yeah, fundamentally in Australia, we fail to accommodate uh, people who might, a, a broad spectrum of people who might be interested in cycling. And um, so anything we can do to increase the number of cyclists overall is, is, is good. But the other thing about e-bikes is that, that there's the hope, and actually there's good evidence from other places that e-bikes uh, do help um, kind of open up cycling to a broader uh, spectrum of people, whether that's uh, older people or people who for whatever reason feel, don't feel confident about their strength or their ability to ride a regular bike, um, or people who have a lot of things or a lot of people to carry. Uh, the prospect of e-bikes, the promise of e-bikes is that they can they can uh, they can address those segments of the population who aren't currently riding bikes. Unfortunately, that's not what our uh, data showed in our survey. Uh, what we what we saw in our survey responses was that uh, that actually e-bikes were even more more likely to be ridden by young men than conventional bikes. Uh, so just the color scheme on these graphs, the next few graphs, blue is, oh, so gray is all survey responses. So that's about, two, about 2065. Orange is people who told us that they had ridden a bicycle of any kind in the last year. So we're calling them, them regular cyclists. Um, and then the blue is people who told us that they had ridden in the last year and that their bike was an e-bike. Okay, so so the statistics are for e-bikes that this 25 to 34 year old uh, cohort is the most likely to to ride an e-bike, and as and uh, that the group of e-bike cyclists falls off even more steeply for e-bikes than it does for conventional bicycles. So kind of the opposite of what we would hope for. Um, and we see the same sort of uh, unfortunate patterns when we look at the
in trying. Um, That's crazy. And uh, can somebody online just give us a thumbs up if they're if they can see in here again? Yeah, back online. Okay, okay, good. Uh, do I have control of my slides again? No, we can. Great. Okay, so so. Uh, hopefully, people online didn't miss too much of that. Um, but basically, within we've got some some age demographics, some age categories where there's pretty significant um, issue of the number of, of female uh, e-bike users. The good news is when we look at how people are using e-bikes, the the news is considerably better. Um, so the first question is, you know, how often are people riding e-bikes compared to conventional bicycles? And um, we can see that that the number of uh, respondents e uh, who said they ride e-bikes, almost seventy percent of them are riding every week, or they've ridden they've ridden in the last week uh, prior to doing the survey, uh, and that's considerably higher than than for conventional cyclists. And if we uh, ask those those respondents who said they've cycled in the last week, and we say, okay, how many times did you ride in the last week? It's hopeful news in terms of that as well. Whereas for conventional cyclists, again, in orange, uh, most of them are in the one or two or three days a week riding bicycle. Uh, for e-bike users, there's a, there's a much higher percentage who are up in the five or even seven, seven days a week. Um, so, so this is good news. Um, that people who are riding e-bikes are riding them more often. The other, uh, so what that suggests is that an e-bike uh, is potentially displacing other types of trips. So we also asked uh, respondents how many cars they have in their household, and we see a pattern that's that sort of backs that up a little bit, where uh, for e-bike e-bike users. A higher proportion of them have just one car in the household, and a lower proportion of them have two or three cars, or three more cars in their um, in their household. And you know, um, if part of the goal as planners is to help reduce the car pressures on a particular street, whether that's for parking or for driving, then uh, statistics like this are are useful, I think, because they suggest that the more people that that ride e-bikes, uh, the less number of cars we need to park, the less number of cars that are going to be on the streets. Um, the other thing that's hopeful in in the data is um, looking at what people ride e-bikes for. Um, and, uh, it's splitting right across the category, but uh, recreation is still and recreation and exercise are still our biggest categories for e-bike users. But for other kind of utilitarian purposes, including shopping, visiting friends, commuting to work, uh, going to public transit or going to school, we see a much higher um, uh, number of people who are, who are riding an e-bike for those purposes. So again, that sort of reinforces the idea that an e-bike is potentially uh, displacing car trips. I should say that, well, you guys probably can't read all the text, but the, we did, they could answer multiple answers here. So our sample for e-bikes is 369 because of that. Um, and this is the last, <clears throat> last one of these charts. Hopefully it's, it's Legible, it's a little complicated, so I'll talk through it. And uh, this one, uh, we asked the question, okay, um, how how long of a trip are you willing to take to go to a particular type of destination? So we asked them about uh, trips to work, we asked them about trips to parks and other open space. We asked them about uh, trips for leisure or for, for exercise. And we asked them about trips to other utilitarian purposes. And the way that this these charts work, um, vertical axis here is the percentage of respondents who are willing to travel uh, for a certain number of minutes, and minutes are on the horizontal axis. axis. So for instance, here, willingness to ride for exercise or leisure, of course, everybody, 100% of people are willing to ride zero minutes for that purpose. 
uh, and 100 percent of people are willing to write about 10 minutes and then over 10 minutes that the number of people who are willing to take that like starts, starts dropping off. And you can see for a lot of categories, it's pretty much the same for e-bikes as for conventional bikes. Uh, commuting with time is, is about the same for everybody. You've got a very clear drop off at 30 minutes. That's a that's a good good maximum commute distance for for a lot of people. See the same sort of pattern for uh, other recre for recreational trips to parks or open space. That 30 minute uh, uh, barrier is pretty strong and pretty consistent uh, willingness to, to cycle uh, for different purposes. Same for other recreational purposes. The good news is when we look at, at utilitarian purposes like picking up or dropping off someone or something, or willingness to ride to a, a restaurant or a cafe, or willingness to ride to a uh, to shopping or to an appointment, we see a much uh, higher percentage of e-bike riders who are willing to ride a longer distance. Um, so that's that's helpful when we're thinking about 30 minute cities or 15 minute neighborhoods that uh, if we can that, that the more people who are on e-bikes, the more destinations are within their sort of tolerance of, of uh, riding time. Um, so that that sort of helps uh, fill in fill in any gaps that might exist in a 30 minute city or a 15 minute neighborhood. Finally, I think this is the last chart. <laughs> um, what are the what are the factors that discourage people from riding e-bikes? And this was an important question because um, you know actually there are a fair number of bicycle advocates that are concerned about e-bikes from the standpoint that you know if if uh, that a local government might say, well, if everybody's riding an e-bike, then we don't need to build bike infrastructure. Right, because because an e-bike rider is going to be comfortable riding uh, faster on the street with cars, and so infrastructure is not as important. So we were curious to see, you know, are, is that is that does that worn out in the data? And it's really not. Um, <clears throat> pretty much. So this chart is organized by, um, yeah, this what what factors discourage it? And I apologize to the people in the room; you probably can't read any of that text. But highest the 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 most discouraging factor for all users uh, is is un, is safe is feeling unsafe due to traffic. Okay, it's the same same exactly the same pattern really for all for all users. So I I think that's I think for for uh, bicycle advocates who are who are interested in bike infrastructure and Brian talked a lot about the the value of safe infrastructure for. Uh, for adolescents, but we see the same pattern for adults, really for all for all cyclists. And I think um, that's probably the, the most important takeaway from this research is that the infrastructure matters for all cyclists. Uh, same 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 res same responses for e-bike users as for anybody else. That if we're not building good infrastructure, then we're not going to attract. Um, as many cyclists as we could, but some other some other implications of this small study. So, uh, even though younger men are the kind of early adopters, that's not ideal from a kind of diversity standpoint. What was really interesting was that among those users, they were riding to a, a, a wider range of uh, destinations and trip purposes, and so as as I talked about, that suggests that that e bikes have the potential to to display. Uh, displaced car trips. Um, no, I'm sorry, skipping around here a little bit, but um, uh, as I just said, that the willingness to to ride longer trip on an e-bike uh, is is perhaps helpful to the thinking about the 30 minute city or the 15 minute neighborhood. And I think that's my last slide. So we uh, we're at 45. So I think. <laughs> Uh, this is a little teaser of what we'll do in our next seminar, I'm afraid. Uh, so I'm going to stop. We'll stop there uh, so we have enough time for Q&A. Um, and uh, when we, the, the next time the, the Sustainable Mobilities Group presents, we can talk about kind of the, the, the model that was built based on the survey results and how we're using that to evaluate uh, bike infrastructure uh, or, or future bike infrastructure. 
And so with that, I'll turn it over to any questions, um, either online or. I have a question about the yeah. styles uh, on the back. Was there a corresponding dip in conventional back sales? So that statistic is just from Bicycle Industries Australia, and it was just on their kind of one page um, fact sheet about e-bikes. So I don't I don't have any uh, comparison across that. Yeah, yeah, it's a, that's a good question. I mean, I think, you know, of course, uh, COVID was a was a I don't know, great, great uh, boon to, to bike <laughs> bike sales of all kinds. And, and I'm sure that that e-bikes for part of that, but I don't know the statistics about how that breaks down. So. I want to know, sort of a bit of an opinion question, really. Do you see e-bikes closer to being cyclist bikes or to lightweight motor scooters as far as speed and health benefits and safety? Yeah, yeah, good, good question. And something that comes up a lot, um, you know, sometimes, especially Given that uh, delivery bikes often are throttle based and and go and are are fast, they can feel a little bit intimidating. Can feel intimidated to get passed by by an e bike if you're on a conventional bike. Yeah, I can I can say that from personal experience, having just transitioned from an e bike to a conventional bike again. Uh, um, so, well, let's, let's see. So I think we have to sort of break that down into categories. So, so first of all, the Australian rules. Australian law is that the uh, throttle-powered e-bike is that's I don't think that's legal in any form in Australia, or at least not in New South Wales. Um, so there are a lot of those bikes here, but they're I think technically illegal. Um, I think by law, uh, the electric assist can only go to uh, 24 kilometers an hour. Am I getting that right? I'm not sure somebody else knows that that number better than I. Um, so, you know, certainly not a motorbike type speed uh, if, if it's a legal e-bike. Um, on the question of health, um, actually the, the studies of that question, you know, do, are, do people who ride e-bikes, are they actually getting exercise? And they are. Uh, and, and of course you, you work less hard per kilometer traveled or, for, or per hour cycled, but because you're, because e-bike trips tend to be longer uh, or at both time and distance, you're actually getting a fair amount of exercise, uh, even if you're using an electric assist motor. Uh, was there another aspect to the question? Safety. Safety. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so that's something that's been talked about a lot and so sort of talked about, you know, do other people feel safe around e-bikes? And that's, that's, um, that perception question, I think, is, is I, I don't know, I, I, I haven't seen any statistics saying that e-bike, e-bikes are much more dangerous than conventional bikes. The, the, except from the standpoint that an e-bike is typically heavier and, and often is moving faster. So, so in a, in a crash, I don't know if that crashes happen more often, but crashes that do happen can be a little more severe just because it's a heavier bike and it's moving faster. Now that's, um, I think as e-bikes evolve, we're seeing e-bikes today that are, that are much lighter than kind of the first, the first generations. Um, so I'm not sure that that's a long-term uh, trend, uh, but, but certainly uh, in research that I've seen, it, it can be a, a bit of an issue. Yeah, what's the, excuse my ignorance about this, but what, what's the, the battery life like, both for a charge, how far, what's the range of how far a bike can go, yeah. and also how, how long do the batteries last and need to be replaced, and what are the sustainability factors? So yeah, 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 good question. Um, <clears throat> I think on the first question, there's no real, because there's, there's such a huge range in how big a battery uh, can be on an e-bike, and how much bicycle that motor is moving, you know, in terms of weight. Um, you know, some some e-bikes. I go back to the early slide with the pictures bikes. Um, you know, some some 
some bikes, some e-bikes, you almost can't see the battery because they're they're thin enough that they're in the kind of down tube of the bike, and you're probably not getting more than a couple of days worth of riding out, out of the charge. Super cheap to charge, like yeah. five cents, twenty cents at most to charge to charge a bike for the day, um, but you're not getting you're not getting a huge range out of a bike like that. Now, if you look at a, a delivery bike, that's a different thing altogether. Often they have multiple batteries. And they're you know designed to be ridden at high at the at top speed all day long. You know, so so um, so you might get a so it's somewhere in between. I mean, I'll just speak from my own experience. My cargo bike, which was a long tail cargo bike, kind of similar to this yellow design at the bottom left corner, I would go for a week without needing a charge. Easy, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, not doing more than ten or fifteen kilometers a day on it, but um, but that was that was not battery life was not a, not a huge issue for me. Our range was not a huge issue. Now, in terms of the the time that the batteries last, I think I think kind of the five to eight year span is is what I've heard as sort of a typical lifespan for for a typical e bike battery. Um, they can be recycled, although I don't know if there's facility. I, uh, I don't know if anybody online has a has a better answer for this. I, I know I've heard about attempts to recycle those batteries in Australia. I don't know if there's actually a facility to do it in Australia or if they have to ship them overseas. Yeah, but it's a good question. I mean, it's a it's probably a, it's an EV question for no, regardless of whether you're talking about cars or bikes, or buses that that I don't that we need the infrastructure to recycle those things at the at the end of their lives. Uh, any questions online? Great. Well, I uh, think we will we can wrap up. I don't know, Brian. Do you have any final things that you want to talk about? Okay. Um, yeah. So we'll we'll stop there then. Thanks very much, uh, everyone, for joining online and in the room. And sorry for you guys for being locked out for the first half. Um, we have our next seminar in two weeks. Um, and so I would just say keep your keep your uh, eyes out for emails about that um, or on, on LinkedIn, and we'll hope to see everybody in two weeks for our next seminar. Thanks very much.